Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. So 2019 has already seen the return of the Toyota Supra and the arrival of the mid-engine Corvette. But for every one of those groundbreaking debuts, there are dozens of cars that are withering on the vine from lack of attention. Earlier this week, we did some investigating and discovered 20 cars on sale today that have been around since at least 2010 with only minor updates. A couple of them even go back decades to the mid-90s. On today's episode, we're going to play a game called Kill It, Invest It, or Let It Ride. We're going to go through each of these 20 oldest cars still on sale today and decide their fate one by one. Joining me is MotorOne.com senior editor and birthday boy Jeff Perez. How you doing, Jeff? Good. Hey, John. Also with us is writer extraordinaire Chris Bruce. How you doing, Chris? Doing good. Happy to play this game. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so this came about um, earlier in this week. If any any listeners have wondered how we come up with some of the articles we write for Motor One, um, we came across this press release from Lotus, and they had updated the Lotus Evora. There's going to be a new um, a new Evora with 400 plus horsepower, and a couple of us immediately responded, "They still sell that." That has, you know, it immediately dawned on us that has been around in the same form for a very long time. And that led us down a rabbit hole where, where um, in our chat room, um, all, of, all of the writers and editors were throwing out cars that they could think of that were old and, and kind of stale and just have been around forever. And the, the list grew very quickly. It grew from five cars to eight to ten. And all of a sudden we realized, all right, this is, this is a good list post. So um, it got our whole team involved, and we all pulled together and came up with 20 um, cars, trucks, or SUVs that are still on sale today. And our parameter was 2010 or older, basically meaning um, you had to be around and on sale with minimal updates since 2010. Um, if you got a full new generation between 2010 and now, then you're, you wouldn't be counted. So you really have to be on the exact same generation for at least going back nine years to 2010. So um, without further ado, we're going to get started and we're going to go from youngest to oldest in our list. So we're going to start with the two, uh, a few vehicles in, in the 2010 uh, age range. So the first one, Aston Martin Rapide. Are we going to kill it, invest in it, or let it ride? Uh, Jeff, let's start with you. Uh, I think it's worth investing in. Uh, even though the, the SUV is coming, I think the Rapide still sort of makes sense, right? If you want a big four-door touring Aston Martin, it makes sense to, to keep it around and have a new generation for it. I think the current design, for as good as it looked when it came out, and it still looks pretty good, it, it looks weird alongside the newer Vantage and the updated Astons. So I think it's worth a new generation. Uh, how about you, uh, Chris? Uh, kill it with fire. Um, <laughs> it's a fine-looking vehicle, but sedans don't sell today, especially sedans and kind of this weird, sporty, Grand Tour, sedan, whatever this thing is segment. So, you know, if you want a four-seat Austin Martin, go buy a DB11 or wait for the DBX to arrive. There's no point for the repeat anymore. Oh, man, this is hard. Uh, I am going to say... Um, urgh, urgh, this is hard. Uh, I'm going to say kill it. Um, I, I could really go any of these three ways, but I'm going to side with you, Chris, because um, I do agree that they, they need that SUV in their lineup right away. Um, sedans aren't selling. And even though some other competitive automakers like Porsche, you know, have the Panamera, you know, that, that I don't think that's really a growth market uh, or a growth segment for them. So um, Aston Martin is actually investing in the Rapide a little bit. They have that um, electric version. But honestly, I think they should just ditch it and put more money back into their cars and in particular their SUV. All right. So two to one on that one for uh, Kill. Uh, next up is the Ford Taurus, which has been around since 2010, um, pretty much unchanged. So um, actually, before we start on this one, I mean, Ford has basically decided for us. Ford is killing it. Um, so do any of us think Ford should do something else? Should Ford invest or keep selling it? God, no. Just kill it. Just get rid of it. I mean, the the show at least is somewhat redeeming, but that is... Uh... A lot of Ford's cars are really old and outdated, and they're not worth keeping around. So I agree killing this generation of the uh, Taurus, but I think there's a 
good point in investing in a new generation. If, you know, we know Ford's going to kill off all their cars. I think that there's an argument for leaving one just in case, you know, just for buyers. If maybe they don't like a crossover silhouette that they would be able to get a traditional four door sedan and in kind of that larger size, I think that could work. So I agree that this generation has run its course, but I would it argue for investing in a new one? Hmm, hmm. This one's tough for me because, uh, as you two know, I am a huge SHO fanatic, uh, particularly of the original generation. Um, I'm happy for the, the current Taurus to die so that uh, used prices can fall on the current generation Taurus, which it can be a really fun vehicle, even though it has its flaws, too. Um, the, uh, the argument you make, Chris, is a decent one, but I, I, I can also see for a, a, an easier path. To success by Ford just just walking away from the cars entirely. I mean, they don't even care that they're not going to have a sedan to sell as a police vehicle. They're they're all in on the Explorer, um, you know. So they, I mean, they've they've pretty much lined lined up their ducks already to go carless. Um, and I ultimately, I actually think they're going to be fine um, from doing that. So I, I'm okay with them killing it completely. So um, so two to one, we're going to side with Ford to kill their own vehicle, uh, the Ford Taurus. All right, next one, uh, Lexus uh, GX, uh, also on sale since 2010 without a major uh, uh, redesign or new generation. Um, and this is, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the body on frame, true SUV Lexus GX, uh, right? Yeah. Okay, so Chris, let's start with you this time. Sure, um, I say invest in it. Um, this size of crossover is popular. In my opinion, the three row RX seems like kind of a compromise to me where, you know, a, a larger three row, I think, makes more sense. So I think throw the money at it and give us a new one. Yeah. Yeah. OK. How about you, Jeff? I actually say let it ride. I think, you know, body on frame SUVs are definitely dying. There's like four or five maybe. And actually, Lexus has two of them, you know, with the larger LX. But uh, this kind of makes sense to just keep around and let it keep going. I mean, they're actually making a little bit of a resurgence. So uh, people who like overlanding, which is, you know, just long stretches of off-roading and kind of living in your, your SUV, which we've, you know, we've covered that extensively. But there's there's kind of a newfound love for the GX. Um, and I think it's good looking enough. I mean, it's got that big, ugly spindle grill, but I don't really see a point in making a brand new one, especially if they're going to switch it to a unibody platform, which God knows they probably will. Yeah, I agree. I, I say um, let it ride. Um, I just read an article um, somewhere, I forget the source, uh, about a, a lot of recent Tacoma and FJ Cruiser rallies um, have a lot of people showing up in the Lexus GX. Um, and Lexus even just debuted that kind of out of nowhere concept, the Lexus GX off-roader that's pulling this kind of off-road teardrop trailer. Yeah, uh, that's so super yeah, cool. yeah, it, it is super cool. So I think I think the I think they can squeeze more juice out of this lemon if they just let it ride. If they have plans to make it unibody, um, you know, then it'll go away eventually, and, and they don't have to worry about it. But I I I don't know yet if. Um, traditional body on frame SUVs are going to go away entirely. They have doggedly hung on in some segments, usually the large SUV segment. Um, so they might let, they could let this ride for a long time and it, it may have enough of a resurgence to even justify um, investing a little in it to, to have a new generation. So we'll see where it goes, but I think we're all in agreement. Keep the GX around. Um, all right, next one. Um, still, um, still 2010, and this is going to be the inspiration for this whole thing: the Lotus Evora. Um, and the one that they debuted um, was the Evora GT recently, and that has the 416 horsepower engine. So, really serious performance machine. Uh, Jeff, let's start with you. Kill it, invest, let it ride. Man, I say kill it. I mean, the Evora is so weird to me it's been around for you know forever and it's positioning in the market kind of doesn't make sense anymore like what does this compete against i mean you can sort of pit it against the the 718 the boxster 
or maybe the new Supra, even though it's mid-engine. I don't know. It's They're really expensive, too. They're ex- That's the thing. They're expensive. They're positioned weird. And they've just been rolling out these special editions forever. I think it's time to just, you know, kill it and start off with a clean slate and start a new nameplate or something completely different that the Avora just doesn't make sense to me anymore. All right. How about you, Chris? See, I this to me is something of a tweener to me where it's not quite let it ride and it's not quite invest in it. In my opinion, I think it's okay to kind of keep iterating on the Avora shape. Um, granted, it's been around forever, but if you look at Lotuses of the past, that's kind of what the company does. I mean, you look at the Lotus 7 that eventually became the Caterham, and that's still around. So I, I don't see anything wrong with just continuing to do what they've been doing and keep making it lighter and faster and better. So kind of incremental investment, but not a whole new vehicle. You know, I for, Lotus is... is a brand I don't think much about, to be honest, because they just don't, they don't make waves. And like you said, they just keep iterating on the same thing over and over again. And and as good as their cars might be in terms of handling um, and their lineage going back to, you know, excellent engineering, um, you just, you just don't hear about them that much. Now they recently made news that they're, they are going to launch a hyper car um, that's all electric called the uh, I, uh, Via, I think is how you pronounce it, with nearly 2,000 horsepower. So right now that's vaporware, but I, I like L- Lotus heading in that direction, and I don't really care what they do with their current lineup because it's just so stale. So I'm going to throw my hat into the kill it ring um, and because th- I'd rather see Lotus go on a new path and, and forge a new future rather than just keep recycling the same old, same old. Um, so I think that's that's two for kill it and one for let it ride. Um, all right, next one. Uh, Rolls Royce Ghost also still we're still in 2010. These are still vehicles that are about nine model years old. Um, the Rolls Royce Ghost, um, which is the smaller sedan to the Phantom, um, has basically been around unchanged uh, since 2010. So, Chris, what do you want to do with it? Kill it, invest, or let it ride? So this is another example, kind of like the Taurus, where we know what's happening. We've seen spy shots of a new Ghost under development, so we know a new one's coming. Um, but also, I think that's smart. Having a, having a Rolls Royce that's smaller than the Phantom but still large makes sense. You might as well keep doing it, and we kind of know they are. Yeah, you agree, Jeff? Yeah, I agree. Uh, it needs some refreshing, though. I mean, the interior in these things is notoriously old school, which I guess makes sense for a lot of their customers. But you have young money coming up that wants a really nice, you know, tech-focused interior, and this doesn't have any of that. So I think it's good to invest in it. Yep, yeah, I agree. Um, call it call it unanimous. I think invest in it. It's been a good uh, model for them. Um, they redid the Phantom and launched the all new um, SUV, and and so I think they're just you know they're just getting to the Ghost, and they just have really long product cycles because they're they're making three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollar cars. So um, definitely we we agree with uh, Rolls Royce's product plan to keep it around. That's a, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, all right, next one. This is a good one. Toyota 4Runner also on sale since two thousand and ten, basically unchanged. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? Ugh, I'm so on the fence on this one. See, my problem is knowing how a lot of manufacturers build modern SUVs, if they invested a ton of money on a new platform, it would for sure go, well, I don't know, it's 4Runner. So my my inclination is that they would go unibody. But knowing the heritage of the 4Runner, I would think Toyota would keep it body yeah, on I don't frame. think they can. I don't think they can ever right? make 4Runner so I would, unibody. So I would say invest in it knowing that it's, or hoping that it's going to stay body on frame because that is a god-awful interior to that car. I think it looks okay <laughs> on the outside, but it is one of the worst interiors of any car on sale. So it needs some serious love all around. How about you, uh, Chris? So I think I'm going to draw some heat for this, but I think kill it. Ooh. Yeah, like, I, I get it, but also I, I think kind of this size of body on frame across SUV has kind of run its course. You mean like the the smaller size? Yeah, I guess. So uh, I, going through my head is that we've kind of seen these rumors of Toyota considering a, a, a small successor to the FJ. And I think that makes more sense, like kind of closer to a Wrangler-sized vehicle. 
Um, yeah, I just, I, I think the the forerunner kind of idea has run its course. I think kill it. Mm. I'm nostalgic on this one. I'm going to say invest because it is a, to me, a, a pretty a somewhat storied nameplate. Um, it's got a lot of good mojo behind it. And it is in a segment of like two. It's like it and the the uh, Wrangler Unlimited maybe uh, in terms of like body on frame, rugged off-road SUVs that aren't giant full-size ones. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, these, these are reasonable sized ones. So it's in a very small segment. And if demand goes up and down a little, it, it, it's captured to take advantage of that when, when there are resurgences. Also, this is, this is a total side note, but I remember um, I had a friend in Hawaii and he was looking for like the perfect SUV and he settled on the Forerunner because its rear glass um, is a power window. It can go up and down. Right. And if, if you put a surfboard in and put the fins of the surfboard behind the glass, the rest of the surfboard can stick out oh, huh. and it kind of locks the surfboard in place so it can't be stolen. And I'm like, well, that's just clever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I've always like appreciated that that roll down window in the back. Of, of the forerunner so i don't know i i find it i totally agree that the interior is wretched and that it is old and and needs an update so if they're gonna invest in it they should do it soon um but i think it's i think it's worth keeping around there's a lot of value in the brand um all right so that's that's two for investing and one for killing on that one Okay. All right. Now we're finally going to leave 2010. We're going to go a model year earlier to 2009, and we've got the Dodge Journey, which might be the least expensive uh, seven-seater on sale today, and really on sale for the last however many years because it's been on sale for so long. Um, So, Chris, what are your thoughts on Dodge Journey? So I got to be honest. Before we did this list, I didn't even realize the Journey was still on sale Oh, I yeah, I yeah. think you got to kill it. Like there, just let this go away. It's te- it's dead. I'm done. That's Does it. it make a difference though that Dodge basically has Durango, right? And then what does it have SUV wise below Durango? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's Dodge to figure out. Up to Dodge to figure out to do something different. But I think. I personally, from the people that I talk to, I don't think there's much cachet in the journey name. And oh, no, I think this not. one is is ready to die. I say put it out to pasture. Okay. How about you, Jeff? So my original thought was obviously kill it. This thing is ugly and terrible. But then I looked at the sales numbers and you guys want to guess how many journeys they sold last year? Oh man, uh, 30,000. I was going to say 80. Ninety-four thousand. Oh my God! God. So, that is a lot. So that's like. Are they going to fleets? Like, can you think? It like, has are they? To. It's an increase. Yeah. It, they sold five thousand more than they did in twenty seventeen. Oh, no way. Crazy. That was good too. They're on par to sell about as many as they did last year. This year, so Who the I don't hell see are buying these things. I have no idea, but I don't see any reason why you would kill it or even update it. Just let it ride until. They stopped selling so many. That's yeah, crazy. From an economic point of view, they might as well. I, I, I mean, can't remember the last time I saw one, but sure. With, with that new information at hand, I'm def, I'm going to rethink my answer because I was going to say kill it too. I wouldn't say let it ride, except a vehicle like this, eventually these things can kind of become a stain on your image. Like, you know, Dodge ha- Dodge has actually done really good in terms of building its brand image the last few years, especially with not much new product to show. Um, They're building it around, you know, the performance um, uh, ethos and and Hellcat and Challenger and and Charger and even Durango's got in on the action with the SRT. So you keep this in the lineup and having to like, you know, put this next to um, the vehicles and dealerships. And I think it actually does drag the brand down at some point. Now, that said, if a vehicle is just printing money, um, then I'm going to say let it ride. And at this point, it, they they must be keeping it around because it is still making money. Um, you know, they're not clinging to this uh, because they're they don't have anything else to plug in that hole. Um, especially because Durango already has three rows, so you know they'd rather have people buy a more expensive Durango. Uh, I just think their Dodge is getting its. Um, 
getting getting its ass kicked by Jeep in 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 terms of like an intra company battle in terms of offering a full slate of SUVs. Um, and the last thing they need is to drop one. So yeah, I'm torn, but I guess I'll say let it ride. Because uh, yeah, if you're selling ninety to ninety five thousand units of something. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're making money on it. So, so actually with Jeff's new info, I actually have to agree. Just let it ride. I mean, all right. I didn't realize they were selling 90,000 plus a year. Sure. If I was a bean counter at FCA, I'd keep it in production too. All right, then Hellcat journey. We call it, (laughs) you know, it's going to come around Hellcat wide body journey, which was, Oh man, we got to get that rendered. We got to get that drawn up right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to stay in 2009 uh, with kind of a similar vehicle, uh, the Ford Flex. Uh, been around forever. Um, still on sale technically this year. Uh, I think, though, like the Taurus, uh, Ford has already decided its fate and it will be uh, going away soon. Am I right? Or is it still open? Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think, think there's think been a verdict for on it. sure yet. Wow. Okay. So this. So this. Um, so this could carry on past 2019 anyway and keep going. All right. Well, let's start with you, Jeff. What do you think? I say kill it. Uh, it's it's kind of cool. It's quirky. But with the new Bronco and the baby Bronco, is there enough room in the lineup for three? You know, quirky SUVs. I don't know. I think more traditional buyers are are going to go for Edge and unfortunately Echo Sport. Um, so I say just kill it. Well, and this is three row too. So technically, if you're looking at this, you might be looking at the Explorer in the showroom. Right, too. that too. Yeah, but just just in the general sense of you know more traditional SUVs, I don't think right. this really makes sense. Uh, what about you, Chris? So just a quick update. I am looking at MotorOne.com's news page. The last time we published a story about the Flex was November of 2016, and it wow. says that it is going to die. Production will end in 2020. So. Oh, it, it, all right. So we could still be right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. But also, yeah, I agree with Jeff. Let's kill it. It's there are other three row SUVs in the Ford lineup that fill this spot better. I personally yeah. never liked the look of the Flex anyway. I know a lot of people on our staff disagree with me on that, but I yeah, it's done. I yeah, I I think it was. Um, I, I give them credit for the experiment. Uh, they certainly didn't need to cling to it as long as they have. Uh, because I think it, it, it proved that it, it wasn't working a long time ago. Um, Explorer sales are are through the roof. I mean, Explorers are selling you know eighteen to twenty thousand per month, and the Flex is like you know one or less than one thousand per month. So um, I think they kept it around because they just needed to keep building things on the Taurus platform to justify building all of those vehicles. Uh, and now that that's coming to an end, uh, this can too. It did have some cool versions. It had like a 350, 365 horsepower version with a twin turbo EcoBoost. Um, but those will be around and, and you can pick them up on the used market uh, if you really love the Ford Flex. Um, all right. Next is, oh, this, this one is, is going to be, this is gonna be an interesting one. All right. All, still, still 2009, uh, Nissan 370Z. All right, Chris, you sound like you have something to say, so I'll let you go. I... Uh... I have done an about face on this one. And it's funny because I have been talking on podcasts about the possibility of the death of the 370Z for at least four years now. So this thing just keeps on trucking. I used to think kill it. I am now in the, I I, I now think to invest in it and do another one. Um, Okay. The 370Z is clearly, it's as old as they come. It, it's not a good car anymore and it doesn't com- you know it's supposed to compete against your, your mustangs and your camaros and stuff like that and it definitely doesn't but i think nissan needs to invest in it and do a proper new one mm, okay how about you jeff yeah see initially i would i would say the same but the more i think about it i say kill it i mean the the money that they're going to make the money that they do make on this is probably very little and they charge you know a stupid amount i think we had one for we had a convertible for $55,000. Oh, my God. It which, is crazy overpriced. Why would you ever buy that? Um, yeah. So I think kill it, and only because the next car on this list, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but you'll see on the next car on this list why I say kill the 370. So I I'm gonna, I, I disagree. I, don't, I do not think it should be killed. I think they should invest in it. I think the nameplate is too strong and valuable to let die. 
Um, and I think um, you, I, I think brands have gotten a lot out of having like a, a attainable performance car in their lineup. Obviously, Mustang, you know, is the prime example of that. Um, now, one could argue that Nissan, with the recent announcement of their layoffs and their poor performance, the last thing they need to invest is something like uh, like another performance car, and they need more SUVs. But to be honest, they have plenty of SUVs, and I think having an exci- a car to get people excited, like the Supra did recently for Toyota or the Corvette for Chevy, would be a really good thing. I also think there's an opportunity. You know, they have a lot of experience in EVs. They've been selling the Leaf forever. Um, it, the Leaf, I think, is still the best-selling EV in the U.S. if the Model 3 hasn't overtaken it. Um, they could potentially make uh, relaunch it as a pure EV, um, again, attainable sports car, and that would be something interesting. Um, so I don't know. I think I just think there's too much value in there to walk away from it. Um, so I'm going to say keep it. So we're we're a little split on that one. Um, all right, I don't even know what the next one is, so you really have me interested. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, this is this is also 2009, and this is the 370Z's big brother, the GTR. Um, all right, uh, Jeff, why don't you start, because it sounds like you have an opinion on this one. So if you're going to kill the 370Z, which they should, they got to go all in on GTR. They got to make this their Corvette. I mean, the mid-engine Corvette now is a thing, which is fine, but the GTR has been such a good car for such a long time, um, the problem is that the price has gone up every year by like thousands. Initially, it was like the affordable sports car in the segment. So I think they need to sort of get back to that, right? They should offer different variants, like a, a base model that's, you know, 70 grand maybe. That's sort of the cheapest, the cheaper that's version a, of GTR. That's about where the GTR started right. uh, when it launched. Yeah. You know, and I think in you, 2009. Yeah. And I think you need a, a wider variety of options because they can make a really good sports car if they wanted to. But if they're sort of splitting their time between the crappy 370Z or the really old GTR, it doesn't really make sense. So they got to go all in on GTR. Mm -hmm. What about you, uh, Chris? What do you think about GTR? I am split, honestly, between all three as I sit here and think about this. I agree with Jeff that if you're going to kill one of these, you have to go all in on the other one. But just in my mind, I'm going back through how it used to be the Skyline GTR. And oh. now the Skyline is the Infinity Q what, 50 everywhere else. So, I don't know. Part of me wonders, do you do you do a reset and whatever the next gen infinity is, do you that make that the next gen? I, I am really, really torn as to which way to go. I guess you shouldn't kill it just because the name has is so powerful. So I guess upgrade it, but I don't know how you upgrade it. Hmm. I think you, I'm going to say invest in this as well. So in my world, if Nissan wants to be a full line automaker, I think it's good to have a strong um, attainable sports car and aspirational sports car, just like, you know, um, Camaro and Corvette. Um, So I I think they would play that well together. I think it would be hard to have a GTR that spread across both those spectrums um, because you just can't bring the price of a supercar like that down far enough. Um, and I'd make the same ar- same argument that I did with the 370Z, that the brand value, the, the, the cachet of it, is, is too strong to let go of. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things they could do with it. I mean, we've seen GTR concepts the last few years that have really gotten people excited about a, a redone GTR. So I hope they invest in it and come out with a, an all-new generation that really makes it competitive, especially in this world where we have you know a mid-engine Corvette starting under 60,000. So... Um, all right, so we're halfway done. Uh, we're we're uh, that was eleven, so we're gonna keep going, and I think they're gonna start getting older pretty quick now. Um, all right, yeah, we're going a year earlier, uh, two thousand eight, and this is the Dodge Challenger. Uh, I'm excited for. Let me go first on this one. My emphatic um, answer for the Dodge Challenger is to let it ride. I love the fact that Dodge has made the Challenger interesting, popular, and relevant again with, without spending very much money at all. Um, they've just been, it seems like their product planners and the air engineers have just been having fun. 
And fortunately, the design of this car, the exterior, it's kind of timeless, the exterior. And in terms of the interior, it's fine. And they've got the Uconnect system, which is the best in the business. So they can, they don't have to worry about that. Uh, I say, let it ride, keep having fun. I want to see what you have next um, with special editions and things like that. Um, you know, let's get a convertible up in here. Let's, you know, you know, just keep going. Um, how about you, Chris? What do you think? So I kind of agree with you. I would say let it ride with an asterisk. I think you've got three or four more years left to really bank on this body style because I agree with you. It still looks good. It is in its own way timeless. I would love to see a convertible. That would be fun. Like there are still things you could do with it, but it's been around so long, like going on sale in 2008. That's, you know, that that's a while. So I think I don't know that there's a lot of future left, but I do think that there is still more you can do with the vehicle. Yeah, that exists I'll, give, now. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Yeah, I certainly don't think it should go forever, but I think I think they're 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 not they don't have to be done with this one if they don't want to be. Agree. Uh, what about you, Jeff? From a personal standpoint, I say kill it because muscle car nostalgia is dumb and bad, and this is the worst example of that. <laughs> but from a professional logical standpoint, you got to just let it ride because they're selling so many of these things. The variations are cool. The wide body is cool. The demon is cool. I mean, yeah, just let it ride. I mean, from a business perspective, I look at the Challenger and I give kudos uh, to jo Dodge and FCA that they're out selling the Camaro while probably haven't invested one fifth of the amount of money in its maintenance and development. Oh, absolutely. So, but the Camaro is so much better. Yeah, I, well, better in, in in from your perspective, but better in terms of sale. Not sales, not really. No. So, uh, but that's another podcast. Uh, let's hop to the next one. Um, we're still in 2008, and now we're at the Toyota Land Cruiser, which is the basically the the, the sister car, the sibling car to the Lexus uh, GX we talked about earlier. This one's even older though. Um, so Jeff, let's start with you. Um, kill it, invest, or let it ride. I don't know. This one's kind of tough for me. I would say invest only because the Land Cruiser name is is so strong. Um, but this is a pretty bad three row comparatively. Um, wait, is this the two row or the three row? Am I miss? Am I mixing these up? Oh man, this is a, a three. The, I think you can only get the two on the LX. Or I right. could be wrong on that, but I think that's the case. Right. Um, so yeah, I just say invest in it just based on name alone. I think you could do something really cool, uh, you know, using some old Land Cruiser, you know, heritage stuff. You know, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw my uh, opinion in here. I it it's tough because I didn't realize when we were talking about the Forerunner that we also have a Land Cruiser that, that 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 is this old. The Land Cruiser has such a great lineage, but man, you look at the Land Cruiser sold today and it has nothing, no connection to that lineage. I mean, it's just not the same thing. Um, so, I mean, if you're already going to sell the GX and that's actually gaining in popularity, maybe it makes sense to just let it ride. So I guess I'm going to say let it ride, but I don't know. I, it seems to me that Toyota has some gems in the fact that they're still making body on frame SUVs and in segments that are shrinking and they can capture what's left of that market. So I, I, I wish they would do something more interesting with them. But at the same time, from a business sense, it, it, it probably doesn't make sense and they should just let it ride until until it either peters out or, or sees a resurgent, uh, a resurgence. What do you think, Chris? So this is another one where we have pretty decent reports that a new generation is coming next year and it will remain body on frame. That being said, I have an interesting product plan for the Land Cruiser. I say, okay. let the current one ride, build it alongside the new one, strip out all the luxury stuff, and have yes. it replace the Forerunner that I said to kill earlier. So basically like have an off-road focused existing vehicle that's body on frame, no luxury goods at all, you know, basic cloth interior. And so you have your basic Land Cruiser for people that want to go out and do stuff. And then you have this new Land Cruiser that's coming that's still body on frame, but can keep all of the luxury goodies that is kind of what's doing. If you did that, the the version that you let ride, that's the stripped out version, that would kind of draw a connection 
to older land cruisers that were much more utilitarian and and probably affordable. Um, so yeah, I like that plan. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with my let it ride, but I like your twist. Um, okay, next one. Um, still 2008, still with Toyota, uh, Toyota Sequoia, which is their three row body on frame uh, SUV. Um, Chris, what do you think about the Toyota uh, Sequoia? I've never understood why the Sequoia and Land Cruiser existed at the same time anyway, so I say kill it. I like my, yeah. let's keep, just have one and call it the Land Cruiser and kill the Sequoia. Ah, that's a great point. Like the Sequoia has no brand value whatsoever. So why don't why didn't they either just call this the Land Cruiser or never build it in the first place? I think it's built alongside the the Tundra yeah, San Antonio. It is. It so is, maybe yeah. they just maybe they just want to give that plant a reason to exist um, because that's surely not uh, at capacity building Tundras right now. So uh, so I'm gonna say um, so. Wait, what was your answer? Kill it. Kill it. I'm gonna say kill it too. I think I think go all in on the on the Land Cruiser badge with whatever you're gonna do with that. Uh, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I agree with that. And the the Land Cruiser and the Sequoia, to Chris's point, make no sense together and easily confused, like I just did in the previous slide. And <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So keep the Land Cruiser just based on name and kill this one. Yeah, and I'd be fine if they want to make a next generation three row crossover on the new Tundra that's coming uh, and call that the Land Cruiser. Um, just yeah, the, the the Sequoia in name is just not needed anymore. I think. Um, all right, um, sticking with 2008, we're going to go back to the Dodge brand and the Dodge Grand Caravan. And I want to point out, with the Dodge Grand Caravan, it was actually uh, it has been uh, I think through the first six months of the year the number one selling minivan. Uh, it has now, been outselling of, the Pacifica when I wrote up the story about yes. it, it, and by quite a bit. By quite a bit. And the reason is partly because it has such a lower starting price compared to all of the newer minivans that you can, it basically allows people to get into a minivan in like the mid 20s or even low 20s. And the other ones all start at like 28, 29. So that's the, oh, and they go into fleets by, you know, the thousands. Um, so that's another reason. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna throw uh, throw my opinion in there first. I'm gonna say, um, oh, actually, <laughs> now I got I got torn at the very last minute. Uh, I wanted to say let it ride because that's what they've been doing. But they also just introduced the Chrysler Voyager, which is basically a cheaper version of the Pacifica, and I do like that. I do, that's a that this has been a well executed I think transition from the older. Dodge Grand Caravan to a new, less expensive um, version of the Pacifica. I think the bad thing is for consumers, which is that even the Chrysler Voyager is not going to be as cheap as the Dodge Grand Caravan. So basically, this very budget friendly um, uh, option is going to go away. So, but I, I still like the the strategy. So I'm going to say kill it. It it with, with um, Kill it with respect. Uh, I, doff, I doff my cap to the current generation Dodge Grand Caravan. It served long and it served well, and it sold like crazy till the very end. And you can't ask much more than that. And it still is uh, selling like crazy. Exactly, exactly. Chris, what do you say? So I have two answers for this one. I think as a vehicle, it's way too old. Kill it. But if I were look working at FCA, I would say let it ride because people are still clearly buying them. So. Hey, if people want them, keep selling them. But as a vehicle, it's it's time to go away. So two hats on yeah. that one. But yeah, uh, Jeff, what about you? I say let it ride. I mean, they sold one hundred and fifty thousand of them last year, which is crazy. So now the margins are probably really thin on them. Yeah. Um, but still, at one hundred and fifty thousand units, that's that's still more than enough bad. to be like, all right, just let it ride for a little bit longer and see what happens. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we know it's going away, so they already made their their decision, uh, and that's again one less vehicle for Dodge. Um, but um, FCA will still have that that kind of budget one in uh, the Chrysler Voyager. All right, we're gonna stick with Toyota. Do you guys see a theme here? Yeah, really. Toyota and Chrysler really are the two biggest defenders. Um, but we're moving back a year. We're going to two thousand seven. Uh, Toyota Tundra. Um, we've been circling with all of Toyota's body on frame products, and I think we're coming back to one of the oldest, which is the Tundra. It's had updates, it's had um, tweaks, but it's still basically the same truck they've been selling since 2007. Jeff, what do you think? Oh, man. Um, 
Well, we know a new Tundra's on the way. Uh, 2021, there's supposed to be a brand new one. But I st- at still, I don't think they've confirmed that it's going to be on a new platform. I think they may just use the same platform, which would be insane. But uh, you got to invest in it. I mean, what the, tr- the truck segment is so competitive right now, and you see Ram doing such a good job, and you see Chevy, well... Chevy's doing what Chevy does best, but they're still selling a ton of trucks, even if the Silverado's not great. Um, But Toyota really has to update this truck and make it more modern. I think the biggest problem is the interior, because when you compare it to the Ram, which is, you know, borderline luxury, the Tundra is not even close. Otherwise, it drives well, the engine's okay, but it just needs some major updating. Yeah. Uh, Chris, what do you think? I agree to invest in it, which we kind of know Toyota's already going to do. But to your point, Jeff, there's a rumor that we saw from Automotive News a few months ago that it's going to go to a new body on frame platform that's going to be shared with the the Tacoma. So it'll be modular that they can kind of, you know, make it fit as needed. Um, But yeah, I agree. Invest in it. Toyota kind of needs to be in the segment. So stick with it. The only reason they sell any Tundras today is because the price point of the Tundra is far below that of the Ram, Silverado, uh, F-150, and Sierra. Uh, That's pretty much the only reason. It's because you can get a burly V8 truck for a lot less than you could get from the domestics. However, it's a terrible product compared to those. I'm going to go against the grain here. I think Toyota should give up on this. Uh, The... The full-size truck segment is the most competitive segment. It is where the most sales in the U.S. are. And the domestic automakers are pros at it. They are just pros. And they are operating at a higher level than Toyota and Nissan with the Tundra have shown that they can commit to operating at. So if they're not going to operate at that level, which I don't think they can. I mean, the, the amount of money it would take to take to take on the domestics is just more than either Nissan or Toyota should ever commit to something like this. I think they should exit full size, put their focus on Tacoma and make sure that they keep their dominance, their lead um, and and kind of their their kind of cult status in the mid uh, the midsize truck segment. Um, And just exit this, you know, they uh, they they gave it a shot. Um, they clearly learned that you you either go all in against the domestics or you'll you'll lose um, right from the start. Um, so I think it's it's time they they just give up because I just can't believe like they it's worth it to sell in such few numbers compared to the to the domestics. Um, so I'd be fine to see it go away. That said, they have a whole plant committed to it in Texas, so I don't know that they're going to walk away from that very easily, but. Um, all right, next one. Um, sticking with Lexus, sticking with 2010, it's the Lexus. 2007. Oh, 2007, thank you. It's the Lexus LX. Um, this is, uh, again, another version of that body on frame um, uh, SUV platform. Um, and it's this a Land is the, Cruiser. Yeah, this is, this is basically the, the Lexus version of the Land Cruiser. Um, and it's bigger than the GX, right? This yes. is like the three row. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Chris, how about you? I say kill it. I think it, do, it to me, it doesn't make sense to even invest the money to put a different nose on the front of a Land Cruiser that that you could just in, invest that same amount into making the Land Cruiser better. I could see an argument for there being a big Le- a Lexus like this, but I could see it more as a crossover with a unibody platform. It's a little bit softer and you know kind of easier. Let the Land Cruiser be the big tough kid in the uh, playground from Toyota. Um, so yeah. I say kill it. All right, how about you, Jeff? Yeah, I agree with that. I don't think the LX and GX make sense together. I think the GX is cool on its own and can survive for a little bit, but Lexus needs to just get rid of the LX, build a more traditional unibody three-row, and call it a day. I'm going to say kill it, with the caveat that I think Lexus should keep at least one body-on-frame SUV because there seems to be some popularity, but I think it's more with the GX than the LX for these like uh, like overlanders and, and people like that. Um, I, I Honestly, Lexus needs a large um legitimate three-row crossover the rxl 
is not it. Agreed. Just <laughs> just pulling out the back of an RX uh, a foot and giving it very ungainly proportions does not a three row full size crossover make. So they need to get in that game, uh, not play around with so many uh, nameplants that are body on frame. So we're all in agreement. Um, it is unanimous. Killed the Lexus LX. Uh, all right, the next one, uh, finally getting a new nameplate or a new brand. Uh, still on 2007, Maserati Gran Turismo. Still in the wow. Fiat Chrysler family, though. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, I had not realized it was this old, to be honest, uh, which might be a testament to its design, you know, kind of being a little bit timeless and not looking like it's 12 years old. Uh, uh, so I don't know. I, let, I need a second to think about this one. I'm going to kick it to you, Jeff. I got a hot take on this one. Sure. Um, just kill Maserati, all of it. Whoa. There is no point for Maserati. I mean, they clearly aren't trying. The Levante is okay, but compared to like the Pentega and the other super, you know, nice yeah. SUVs, it's not even close. So if they're not going to bother updating the Gran Turismo, which to your point actually looks really nice for being over 10 years old still, um, Maserati just makes no sense for FCA anymore. Wow, Chris, you agree? Yeah, I, I. In fact, I agree with the kill Maserati, which is sad because it's such a historic mark and so important. But I, there's nothing really there that needs to be there. It's all pretty, just it, blah. Well, um, right. It, none of it is best in class. Right. Well, and I know. mean, the thing is, they have Alfa Romeo. FCA has Alfa Romeo. So right. And that you, you could position that to fill the exact same niche. So. Yeah. I, I agree with Jeff. Not only kill the Gran Turismo, kill Maserati. I'm going to make it three. I agree as well. And I might put the caveat that you want to kill it and put it on ice because I think you could resurrect it later for a different purpose or something like that because it is it is a historic nameplate. Tons of value there. Uh, I just think they've turned it kind of into like, you know, this... Dead like brand London, walking. De, dead brand walking. But yeah, just like a, a, a brand of, of vehicles that don't deserve the name of Maserati. Yeah, and to uh, Chris Bruce's point, I mean, you have Alfa Romeo and Maserati. Instead of two subpar luxury brands, why don't you just do good on one of them, which is right. I know it's a, I know it's a oh, big Jeff, ask. Oh, Jeff, I know SCA. you're kind of a Julia fan. Come on. <laughs> I love the Julia, but <laughs> it's just it's crazy that these two brands are, you know, subpar and they're kind of just floating around. It, it doesn't make sense. I mean, I think they see them as differentiated like Alfa is uh, less expensive and and Maserati's more, but um, I, to be honest, uh, Alpha has more exciting products right now that I care about than Maserati. So, um, ouch. So, all right, Universal. Um, it's a three-way kill for the entire brand for Maserati. Um, all right, next one. We're going to jump a few years back, going all the way back to 2005. It's the venerable Nissan Frontier. Uh, their their midsize pickup uh, goes all the way back to 2005. That's 14 years old. Um, and it still and sells well. It still sells well. All right, Chris, what do you say? I uh, kill it, invest, or let it ride? Let it ride. I mean, I know there's rumors that we're a few years away from a new Frontier, but it sells so well, and it's this old. I mean, whatever tooling has to be have been paid off ages ago. If there are so many people that want them, let's just keep building them. Uh, what about you, Jeff? Uh, you... I sort of agree with that. I mean, they sold 80,000 last year, which is still really good for a truck that's, you know, ancient. Um, but I think they need to invest in it. I think they need to build a new frontier from the ground up because they're in a perfect position, right? You have the Ranger, you have the um, the Jeep, I'm Gladiator. Um, so you're seeing all these trucks and you just need to take all of them and say, how can we do this better? Theoretically, right? Then again, you know, Nissan. So... I think that's what they need to do. They need to start from the ground up, build a new frontier, and make it super, super competitive with the trucks that are on sale right now. Hmm. I'm going to say let it ride. And what I want to see them do is exactly what Chrysler did with the Challenger. They have a truck that's still selling well that they could iterate on and maybe tap into some veins of passion amongst the, the buying public, some nostalgia, some whatever, and and get some some sales and excitement brewing and keep it going for another three to four years i don't know sales in the mid-size truck segment this year have actually been falling and the whole segment is so competitive now 
um, that I don't know if they spend the money to build it from the ground up that they're going to see a huge return on it right away. So I'd rather have them take their time, you know, maybe plan that for four to six years out and start iterating on this. Start playing on um, the Frontier name. Um, there's some really good nostalgia in the Frontier plate, um, you know, that they could probably draw from or at least in like the Nissan truck um, brand. Like um, didn't. Did Ivan Iron Man Stewart drive a Nissan? Drove a Toyota, I believe. Oh, drove a Toyota. All right. Well, they can't use that one. But uh, Nissan had the King Cab, didn't they? Yes. Okay. So there were some King Cab. I remember some King Cab versions uh, that were pretty cool. And I don't know. I I think this is an opportunity where they could um, not just get away with, but actually have have a nice little win uh, by continuing to use the same platform until they see... Um, how the segment's going to shape out until they they get more um, better uh, get get more solid footing underneath themselves because they're really shaky right now. I just don't see their pathway to extreme profitability. It runs through the Nissan Frontier. Though I think it runs more through through crossovers. Though to back this with some news, there's already reports that a new one is coming in 2020, and it won't get a new platform. It'll get the updated platform. But these are just rumors at this point. I think. All right, so we'll have to see when it comes out if it qualifies for being considered new or if we're going to just extend its its run from 2005. Which, just a um, quick side note, it's kind of interesting that, you know, in foreign markets, Nissan has the Navara pickup, which has been yeah. updated twice since the Frontier came out. And you kind of almost have to wonder why those aren't just a unified vehicle at this point if, you know, whenever a new Frontier arrives. But it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Yeah. All right. Um, now we're getting near the end, um, and I think we're at our last two vehicles, and we're going to take a big jump. <laughs> we're going to jump from 2005 to 1995, and and these are going to be the two oldest vehicles still on sale. Uh, the first one, the Chevy Express full size rear wheel drive van. Uh, I believe this is uh, well. It's mainly sold as a commercial vehicle now. Um, so you're going to see your plumbers using them and, and stuff like that. Um, you might find them on some other, like they might have the the cab, the cab version where they have, you know, upfitters put different things on the back. Uh, but this is an ancient vehicle. We're talking 24 years on the market. Um, and it's basically the same thing as it was then, just with, with up, updates around the edges. Uh, Jeff, what do you think Chevy should do with the Express full-size van? So if I don't see my plumber or air conditioning guy pull up to my house in one of these, I will assume that it's a fake because (laughs) this is like such a synonymous work van and it has been forever that I can't imagine they would ever kill this or even need to update it. So they just got to let it ride and keep selling it to anybody who needs, you know, a big spacious van for all their tools. Hmm. All right. What do you think, uh, Chris? I kind of have to agree. Maybe this is just a case of there is an ideal van that you can build and Chevy and our next one we'll be talking about in a second. They kind of figured it out and you don't need to do that much to it, that you can kind of make these incremental upgrades over time and that it works. So I, I agree. Let it ride. You know, I think Chevy... Um, accidentally found a niche for this vehicle because um, um, Ford, like, like work vehicles have changed in the U.S. Ever since the Sprinter came, they've been European style, mm-hmm. tall roofs and things like that. Um, and and there's really not many of these old school kind of U.S. style vans. Nissan still sells the NV uh, and Ford sells the, the E-Class in, in some version, but not like this. So I think it's kind of the only one in the market that companies can go to if they just want a cheap work van and they don't want to pay Sprinter Ford Transit prices um, um, or Dodge, uh, or not Dodge, the Ram Promaster. Um, but what I would honestly like to see, and and you guys know I'm a huge RV nerd, I love motorhomes, I would love to see Chevy invest in a new van platform and go toe-to-toe with your sprinters and your transits. And not only because I think those make cool work vans, but they make really cool uh, basic, it makes a really cool basis for motorhomes and for camper vans and, and a lot of really cool personal mobility vehicles like that. 
Um, so I would just like to see innovation, more, even more innovation in that category because it's been so fun to watch uh, ever since we've got all these new players in and to see what people do with those vehicles. Um, I don't think that's what Chevy's going to do. Uh, I think they're going to let it ride because uh, they've been doing it for so long. Uh, but, you know, that would be my, I, I, that would make me super excited if, if they got serious about it and came out with an all new van platform. Um, so that actually rolls us right in to the last one. Uh, this is the oldest vehicle still on sale. Um, and unsurprising, it is the Ford E-Series, the, uh, not really the Econoline, because that was the passenger van version. This is strictly the commercial version, and not just that. It is the, um, uh, what do you call chassis it? Chassis cab. The, the chassis cab version, right. So you basically, all you can buy is the chassis cab version, where it's just the cab up front and then nothing on the back. And what it usually turns into is either a work vehicle or a motorhome or something like that. Um, but it has been on sale since 1992. I can't even count that high. How many years is that? 27? Yep. Yeah. Is that 27? 27 years this vehicle has been built. And I will say, uh, I, uh, I'm at home in Cleveland right now, and this vehicle is built about five miles away from me at the Lorraine assembly plant. Um, or no, Avon Lake assembly plant. And uh, they have been churning them out. I drive by there all the time. And, and that is just a happy little plant that, that pumps out tens of thousands of these things. And they are still bought in droves. Um, and one reason is there, when, when you are buying a vehicle, it's pretty nice to have one that is so universal that has used the same V10 engine for decades that parts are readily available for, that anybody can fix. So it is the ideal work vehicle. And, and so... I'm going to say they have to let it ride. It is, it is like the corner, it is the keystone of, of a couple of giant industries, the work industry and the RV industry. Mm -hmm. and, and if you just completely redid it and took it away, that industry would have, there would be various, very serious ripples in, the, in those industries uh, because they would have to just turn everything over to supporting a completely different vehicle. So I'm going to say let it ride. It is a veteran. It is a workhorse. Um, and uh, some really great stuff uh, has been built on it and continues to be. Uh, Chris, what do you think? I completely agree with you. You have to let it ride. I mean, if someone needs an alternate solution, the transit is there. But like you said, there are so many industries. Like, How often have you driven by any type of line worker at the electric company? They drive you know, modified E-series with, you know, the cherry picker and stuff on them. Like, that, that's just what it is. So, you know, like you were saying, there's so many different industries that have just kind of been built on top of this vehicle that, and they work. And, I, you know, I haven't heard, I've never heard anyone complain. So just keep it going. Right. What about you, Jeff? Yeah, I agree with that. And fun fact, the E-Series and I are actually the same age, so that's <laughs> neat. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's there's no there's no reason to invest too much in it or update it too much. It's been the ideal, you know, heavy-duty work vehicle, like Chris said, for, you know, cherry pickers, whatever. That's It's been around forever, and there's really no need to change it. So they did say, though, that in 2021 there's going to be a refresh, quote-unquote, but I don't even think that's going to mean a new chassis or anything i think they might just keep it around as is yeah yeah i think uh it'll be it'll be some kind of update so uh i wanted to, to bring up this uh interesting factoid there is a a company that still makes a four by four conversion of the econoline van uh and then they make a camper van out of it and i think the company's name is sportsmobile and they ran into a problem when ford canceled the Econoline and started only making the chassis cab versions because they, they you know, can't make um, a camper van out of it. So they began building a fiberglass shell to put on the chassis cab version that actually made it exactly like the old Econoline. They, so they, they're basically building from the B pillar back um, a fiberglass shell that looks like the old Econoline's body. Um, so that they can keep making these four by four econoline or e class based uh, camper vans, and I was like, "That's 
awesome innovation and ingenuity. Like you're, you're making this vehicle, Ford cancels it, and you're like, well, they still make the E-Class chassis cab. We'll just keep using that and make our own fiberglass bodies to put behind it. So, um, you know, like I said, this vehicle is just, it is so ubiquitous, you may not even know it. It may, it, there may be so many around you, they're just invisible as part of the landscape, but, um, you know, you talk to people in these industries and they say like they don't know what they would do if Ford all of a sudden stopped selling the 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 E class. So um wow. So that what that that's it. That's twenty up and twenty down for the oldest vehicles. Um kill them, invest in them, or let them ride. Um I'm surprised. More I I think we decided to invest in more of them than I thought we would. Um and, and I thought we would decide to kill a lot of the a lot of them. And it feels like we, we did fewer than I expected. Um, okay, so I want to keep going. Um, we had some reader comments um, last from last week's episode. And uh, I just want to read one that was kind of a, a, a funny one. This is from Blake S. Um, and he wrote, uh, love the podcast, guys. It's funny. As cool as the C8 is, uh, and he's talking about the Corvette, I still can't afford it. I actually care more about the $40,000 in undercards as they are realistic in my life. That was why I liked it when you guys spent time on the Kia Soul. I find it far more impressive to make a great $35,000 car than a $300,000 Ferrari. That's hilarious because that's the third comment about people uh, who have liked that we talked about the Kia Soul. So. I think Blake and I are kindred spirits. I am very much the same way. You know, in my opinion, finding a fun, cheap car is a lot more impressive. I, you know, I go to car shows and stuff like that. And you see like you see Ferraris or stuff like that. And you just have to for me, I just kind of walk by them because I know I'm never really going to own one unless something really, really interesting happens in my life. So I don't put that much attention to them. But, you know, the guy who has the, you know, the really clean third gen Supra, I'll pay attention to him. So I agree with you, Blake. I just really like how there's been <laughs> so much just passionate reaction to the to the Kia Soul discussions that we've been having. I don't know what it is about that that vehicle. It just it just has a little extra sprinkle of something interesting uh, compared to everything else in its segment and around it. So we'd love to hear what what you think about our list of twenty of the oldest vehicles and what what should happen to them. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Motor One Com, where the discussion continues, and of course on our website Motor One dot com, where you can find us in the comments. Coming up, you'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Before the break, though, uh, a quick reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So why not hit the subscribe button now so you never miss a show? Welcome back. Uh, During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with Jeff. Uh, Jeff, what are you driving this week? I am driving the new Chevy Blazer RS all-wheel drive black package or something. Ah, that's what I drove uh, last week. Actually, it was the same vehicle. I was yeah. in I was in Miami, so um, I gave my thoughts on it last week. I'm a Blazer fan. What are you? Man, I have so many issues with the Blazer, right? Oh, man. So the first one is the name. Blazer is, I don't know if it's as iconic as Bronco. Actually, I know it's not as iconic as Bronco. So... It's not super offensive that they brought it back and slapped it on, you know, a unibody crossover, whatever. I love the way it looks. I think it looks super cool. And if they're trying to do Camaro crossover, I think they did a really good job of making the exterior styling reflect that notion, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, My second positive is that it sounds really good. And I haven't totally researched if it's augmented through the speakers, which it probably is. But if you put it in sport mode and, you know, slam on the gas, it's sounds really nice and then that's sort of where it falls apart because uh, I don't know there are so many good crossovers that are really nice to drive that are well equipped and that aren't this expensive so the one we're driving with the blackout package all-wheel drive RS 55 grand that's indefensible I agree I, I, I think for me that for me that's the blazers one and only fault is its pricing Otherwise, I think it looks great. I love that it's low and wide, and I think it, it actually handles better because of that. I was just driving a Honda Passport, and, it, and, and and I drove it right after driving the Blazer, and it felt like it was on stilts. Like, it was it felt so thin and tall, and the Blazer just felt like, I don't know, it felt very planted uh, because of its kind of dimensions. 
Uh, but yeah, the price is indefensible. Yeah, but I, I I don't even totally agree with you there that it feels planted. It feels like it's fat and rolling around compared to you know what else you can get. Even the Edge ST, I would say, probably handles a little better. According to what Greg Fink, you know, has written about, I think the Edge ST is well true. But that's that's an actual performance version yeah, of, a, of an but SUV. If they're if they're positioning the Blazer as this performance e SUV out of the box, I think it needs to be a little better. And then the interior is just. It's a GM parts bin, is what it is, and it's totally. I think the screen is actually really nice, and the the graphics and the layout is super easy to use compared to what Ford or Dodge is doing. Um, I don't know, but it's just it just doesn't do it for me. And at fifty five grand, it just it makes zero sense. Not for fifty five. At forty five, I'd be a lot happier with it. Uh, I could probably defend it with a leg to stand on, but uh, I'm usually alone in my defense. Uh, okay, Chris, uh, what have you been driving this week, or have you been doing something other than driving with cars? So I, that sounds weird. What have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I guess if we want to get technical, I have been driving a uh, convertible Ferrari Testarossa. It, I'll wait for the laughs. That's, that um, sounds fun. <laughs> except that, Do so tell. I have been spending some time playing the old game Outrun, which for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's uh, by Sega in 1986. And it puts you and a blonde woman in behind the wheel of a car that looks practically identical to a Testarossa, but is just has the file number, the numbers filed off enough not to be copyrightable. Um, and it's just a super fun old game. And, Wait, what are you playing it on? Uh, so I do have it on the Sega Genesis, but that's not a perfect arcade perfect version no, there's not. a really good version on the uh, nintendo 3ds and i think it's also it got ported to the switch i believe um and those are just arcade perfect solid versions and you can set it up so there you have like infinite time so you don't even have to worry about running out of time so you can just do whole runs and it's super fun um but then the other part is when i'm not playing it i've actually picked up the soundtrack on vinyl and i've been listening to that and that sounds super nerdy and it is but it's such a good soundtrack it's it it sounds like very like night late 1980s miami um is the best way i can describe it it's like super synthy but then also like miami sound machine so it, it's kind of fun and poppy as well it's it, it's all good both ways Ooh, excellent choice it's funny you know when i'm perusing the app store on my um on my iphone there are so many outrun style ripoff games yeah. uh, today, and it just it makes me marvel at the original and how good it was, and that in this new era of you know everyone having a supercomputer in their hands, they take this game that's uh, so iconic from the eighties. Yeah, like, for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's it's very. It, by modern standards, it's very rudimentary. It's not like an open world or anything. You, the camera is set right behind the car, kind of low, and you're driving and you're trying to weave in between traffic. And there's a timer, and every once in a while, the road splits. And so that's what kind of gives you. That's what makes the game interesting because you you can the road splits and you can pick your path ahead. And it splits. I think five different times so if you work it out there's multiple roads that you can go down and different ways that you can get there and so yeah it's it's a simple idea but the fact that kind of you can also kind of choose your own path and it still works today my favorite part was when you crash yep. and the car does this like uh it starts it rolls and ejects you and your female passenger yep. <laughs> to the side of the road and does this really graphic uh, roll crash uh, and and yeah you end up on the ground and then of course you show up in the middle of the road blinking and, while cars run through you and then you get to start over again yeah so I'm a little younger and I never played Outrun but my go to was Cruise in World on oh it's basically the same board. game it's like, Cruise right. in World is a iteration on the same idea yeah yeah so but to your point about the soundtrack that Cruise in World intro song is forever burned in my brain i cannot get it out it wow is... man i never i never had these connections to video game soundtracks uh i'm gonna go back and listen to outrun though because now you have me interested the second track here i, I 
pulled up the track listing. Uh, the second track is called Passing Breeze. That's that's a real good one. What a great name. And then yeah. the next one is called Splash Wave, which is kind of more of a rock track. Those are the, uh, There's only four tracks to the so- uh, soundtrack originally, so there's not much to listen to. Oh, so not a very large album. No, no, not a very large. But not you good. can you don't have to buy the vinyl. You can find it on YouTube. You don't have to be nerdy and throw it on vinyl. You can just pull up <laughs> Outrun soundtrack on YouTube, and I promise Such you, a you'll find it. Thing to do. <laughs> Um, all right, so this past week I have been driving a 2019 Honda Odyssey Elite, which oh. this is one of my favorite vehicles. Uh, I have I do not have kids, but I have long been a champion of minivans as kind of the ultimate vehicle. And really, Honda just consistently makes a great minivan. Uh, I haven't driven uh, this current generation of Odyssey until now. And, and since, I've, since I drove the last one, I've had a chance to sample a few Chrysler Pacificas. So I've been a, I've been a Pacifica fan the last few years, um, but getting back into this Odyssey reminds me just how good of a minivan Honda makes. It is the only minivan that legit drives so close to a regular car. Like it feels low, it, again, it feels low, it feels planted. Um, the, the 280 horsepower V6 has plenty of, of power. Uh, and then just all these, these little features like the Honda Vac and, and some of this other stuff, it's just so user friendly. Um, I'm glad I don't have kids because my, uh, that's kind of a weird thing to say. <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't bring life into this world. Uh, no, I look at my, my brothers and my in-laws who have kids and uh, my, my brother-in-law just had a Toyota Sienna for two years on a lease and his kids destroyed it. I mean, just, you know, caked on, on stains and, and scrapes and scratches and dents and and I'm just a person who just likes to keep their vehicles in pristine condition. So I would I would die if I spent forty eight thousand dollars on a Honda Odyssey Elite and then had uh, a couple of Rugrats destroy it. I I think I would just have to buy a fifteen year old used minivan that's already destroyed and let them have at that because I could just never never taint you know a, a beautiful fifty thousand uh, dollar loaded minivan but uh so far uh i absolutely love it i'm gonna review it so you can keep an eye out for that uh, on motor one in the next few weeks and that brings us to the end of our show uh you can follow jeff at, on twitter at not a boat captain uh chris bruce at chris bruce 1985 and me at john underscore m underscore neff Uh, I want to thank you guys for being here with my host. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. And of course, thank all of you out there for listening, and we'll see you next week.